The God in the Bible, Old Testament, is not the genuine greatest creator. Xie Feng. First of all, we have to admit that the Bible is the accomplishment of the Ephraim which loyally records the Jewish history, explains the relationship between the God, devil, and human beings to the furthest degree, and gives the direction the human beings should take. The Bible, the Quran, the Buddhist scripture, and the Tao Te Ching are the eternal and effective treasures and collections of human wisdom, teaching us how to behave and develop into the higher level of life space. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The first sentence in the Bible did tell the truth. But the things covered by the Cossack may not be the holy things. And the people wearing the sacred cassock may not be the abbot. The problem with the Bible is that the God it introduces is not the genuine greatest creator. We have known that the greatest creator has the eight features. The greatest creator is unique and exclusive, amorphous, neutral, mysterious, impartial, merciful, supremely powerful and intelligent. The wisdom of the greatest creator is revealed through its creation of universe order, designing of life program and knowing of the past and the future. Then, does the God in the Bible have the above-mentioned eight features? Let's explain this with examples. The Betrayal of Adam and Eve According to the Genesis, Adam and Eve were instigated to eat the fruit on the wisdom tree forbidden by the God in the Bible. Because they have violated the order of the God in the Bible, they were repelled out of the Eden. It indicates that the God in the Bible is a incompetent, b improvident, and c unjust. He is incompetent because he was a loser at the beginning. The first couple of human he created betrayed him. So can we still say it is supremely powerful? Can we still believe in a person who often loses? The Great Flood had killed most of the human beings. What happened to them afterwards? They still wouldn't listen to his words. The Moses Ten Commandments are actually the directives of the God in the Bible. Can you tell me how many of them are obeyed by the human being? Actually not even one. The God in the Bible seemed to know nothing about how to control the human beings. The only measure it takes is to voice warnings and threats against the human beings. Thousands of years has passed, the human beings remain the same. Is there no means to control the human beings? Or is there some other force constraining this Almighty God? If this is the case, is this God not sole or exclusive? For thousands of years, the human beings have been violating His order. What is He waiting for? The God in the Bible is improvident because he didn't know that Adam and Eve were going to betray him or the development trend of what he had created. Is this God, who is not able to predict the future or the past, still reliable? If the earth is going to get out of the solar system and this God knows nothing about it, how can he save the human beings? How can this God administer the deities, Buddha, celestial beings and devils when he found it difficult to control the human beings? How can he manage the spacious universe? The God in the Bible is unjust because it cannot tell wrong from the right and because it is unreasonable. Why would Adam and Eve betray the God in the Bible? There are three major reasons. First, the genetic structure of Adam and Eve had faults or was imperfect. The life created by this God was now its own constraint. This angered the God very much. It is just like the house built by an architect who put every efforts was fallen and hit his own feet. Is the house or the architect that should be blamed? The second reason they betrayed is that they were instigated and seduced by the snake. Adam and Eve are humans while behind the snake was the devil Satan. The energy and wisdom of human beings can't match those of the devil. This God didn't punish the devil Satan. Instead, it imposed inflictions on Adam and Eve and drove them out of Eden. Is it fair? If a rapist raped an eight-year-old girl, would it be fair to blame the girl for her sexual organ and weakness instead of bringing justice to the rapist? The third reason of betrayal, which is also the most important one, is the damned wisdom tree that can tell the good and evil. Who has planted it in the Eden and why? It's just like putting a poisonous sweet on the dinner table for the kids. 
or it's like playing the porn video for the young girls while teaching them to retain their innocence. Would a moral person do such a thing? Isn't this person who planted the wisdom tree in the Eden has caused the betrayal of Adam and Eve? Besides, does this God, who had created Adam and Eve, has other measures to take rather than driving Adam and Eve out of the Eden? Is it fair not to give them a second chance simply because they have made only one mistake? Does one mistake justify their lifelong sins? Jesus came to the mortal world to atone for the human being's sins. According to the Bible, all the people have their original sin. Where does the original sin come from? Actually, they are inherited from Adam and Eve, the ancestors of human beings, whose sins were formed because they had eaten the fruit on the damned wisdom tree. When we are born, we have the original sin inherited from Adam and Eve. The cross on our back was much too heavy. According to this logic, the son of a thief is always a thief, the son of a criminal is always a criminal, and the son of an emperor is always an emperor. That's why in ancient China, in the feudal period in particular, if a man committed crime, all his family members would be sentenced to death, or if a man attained the Tao, even his pets ascended to heaven. This also explains why the thrones can only be passed on to the next generations of royal families. This is because it complies with the logic in the Bible. If somebody has sins, the God in the Bible and the Satan signed first. Is it humanitarian to inflict on billions of humans throughout the history simply because of the wrongdoings of Adam and Eve? Why not executing Adam and Eve and creating a new pair of humans at the time? Is creating a new couple so difficult for the God in the Bible? All the people are born with sins. This is why each of us comes to the mortal world to endure the sufferings. But the sins are not inherited from our ancestors. They are made by our slaves in the previous cycle of life. If we don't have sins, we would all have become Buddha or celestial beings. 10 Plagues of Egypt According to the Exodus, when Moses and Aaron, in the capacity of the God in the Bible, asked the Egyptian pharaoh to let the Israelis leave Egypt, they were refused. Consequently, the God in the Bible imposed ten plagues on Egypt. 1. Plague of blood the water of the Nile will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. 2. Plague of frogs. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed into the houses of your officials and on your people, and into your ovens and kneading troughs. The frogs will go up on you, and your people, and all your officials. 3. Plague of Lice The dust of the ground became lice. Lice came upon men and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became lice. 4. Plague of Flies The houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies, and even the ground where they are. 5. Plague of Livestock Death The fifth plague of Egypt was an epidemic disease which exterminated the Egyptian livestock, that is, horses, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep, and goats. 6. Plague of Boils The sixth plague of Egypt was Shkin. The Shkin was a kind of skin disease, usually translated as boils. 7. Plague of Hail The seventh plague of Egypt was a destructive storm. 8. Plague of locusts, locusts will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. 9. Plague of darkness, total darkness, covered all Egypt for three days. 10. Death of the firstborn, the tenth and final plague of Egypt, was the death of all firstborn in Egypt. No one escaped, from the lowest servant to Pharaoh's own firstborn son, including firstborn of livestock. It is understandable that the god punished Egypt because Egyptian pharaoh wouldn't obey his order. However, it was unreasonable and went too far to kill the firstborn of all humans and animals in Egypt. You can punish the Egyptian pharaoh for his disobedience. Why inflicting on the common people? Even worse, the god would kill the kids of the girl slaves working as donkeys in the lowest rank. Can we still say the god behaving like this merciful? It was behaving without humanitarianism just like a devil. Even more abominable, the pharaoh of Egypt wouldn't let the Israelis leave mainly because the god had hardened the pharaoh's heart. Before the ten plagues came, 
the God in the Bible had done something. According to 7 3 in the Exodus, Jehovah told Moses, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. It means the God in the Bible had prepared a trap for the Egyptians, trying to find an excuse for the following plagues. In Exodus 8 verse 19, Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. In Exodus 9 verse 35, And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. In Exodus 10 verse 20, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go. In Exodus 10 verse 27, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. In Exodus 11 verse 10, And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. It was the God in the Bible who let the Israelis leave Egypt. But it was the same God who had hardened the Pharaoh's heart and sparked the conflicts so that the Israelis couldn't leave Egypt easily. So what the God in the Bible was doing? It was encouraging the people to revolt while telling the authorities about the revolt and encouraging the government to oppress them mercilessly. Isn't such a person a schemer and two-faced? So is this the image of the greatest creator? The Israelis are the people of the covenant. The Bible has the Old Testament and the New Testament. The part telling what happened before Jesus was born was called the Old Testament, and the part telling things after Jesus was born was the New Testament. The Testament actually means agreement, covenant, and contract. The whole Bible is the agreement, covenant, and contract between the Israelis and the greatest creator. So here is a paradox. There are over 3,000 nations in the world, and why the God has established the Testament with the Israelis? Does this mean the other nations are not the subjects of the God? If they are, why has the God only established the Testament with the Israelis while neglecting all the other nations? If they are not, what's the origin of all the other nations? Are Adam and Eve only the ancestors of Israelis and not the other nations? The Israelis are created by the God. Does it mean the other nations are created by the devil? There are 1,656 years between the Genesis and the Great Flood. There are 857 years between the Great Flood and the Exodus. There are 396 years between the Exodus and the founding of the Israeli state. There are 510 years between the founding of the Israeli state and their captive to Babylon. There are 152 years between their imprisonment in Babylon and the re-establishment of Jerusalem. There are 450 years between the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the birth of Jesus. There are 2,003 years between the birth of Jesus and today. So according to the Bible, the history of human beings is about 6,376 years. According to the Bible, there were only eight people survived the great flood on the earth. They were the couple of Noah, their three sons, and their wives. It means that 4,700 years ago, there was no one else living on the earth except for the Noah family. But this has brought some other questions. First, where did the American Indians come from? According to the theory of continental drift, America drifted away from the other continents. But it couldn't happen within 4,700 years of time. Then how the Noah family reached America from the Middle East. After the Great Flood, there were only eight members in Noah family. It was impossible for them to get dispersed. Noah couldn't let one of his sons and his wife to cross the freezing Siberia in the Bering Strait to get to America. Second, where did the African blacks come from? From the perspective of genetics, the blacks, yellows, and whites have their separate ancestors. A couple of pure whites couldn't generate the blacks and yellows. Even the evolvement couldn't produce the blacks and yellows in 3,700 years of time. Besides, According to Darwin's evolutionary theory, the survival of the fittest, could the Israelis able to write the Bible evolve into the African blacks? The blacks are not the matches of Israelis in the intelligence, no matter how we exaggerate their abilities. Now let's come to the Chinese nation. The first Chinese king was born about 4,600 years ago. 
The story of Dayu's flood control happened about 4,200 years ago. It was impossible for the future generations of Noah to come to mainland China 100 years after the Great Flood. Even if they did it, how could they produce so many people who followed Dayu to control the flood? Where does the Chinese nation come from? Are the flood control by Dayu or just the Great Flood? From the perspective of the Bible, the biological evolutionary theory could never be accepted. But once we accepted the theory, it would deny the theory that the God created the human beings. But if we denied the evolutionary theory, there was no way to explain the origin of the blacks and yellows, and we can't say Adam and Eve are the common ancestors of all human beings. The Story of Cain The first child of Adam and Eve, after they were driven out of the Eden, was Cain, followed by Abel. And in process of time it came to pass, that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Out of jealousy, Cain killed his brother Abel. We want to ask the God in the Bible some questions. Why do you favor the offerings of Abel instead of those of Cain? Is Cain killing his brother Abel not your fault? If you had never favored one of them, how could it arouse the jealousy of Cain? Why the people created by you had so many troubles? Adam and Eve wouldn't follow your orders, and their kids killed each other. As the God, you don't have the ability to solve these problems? Or is it what you have designed? Cain was a murderer and deserved the punishment. But you told Cain, Therefore whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. So what kind of the justice standard is it? It is hardly understandable not to levy the punishment on the criminal. But it is even more understandable to have revenge of sevenfold on those who would punish the criminal. Is it protecting the criminal? That's why the few thousand years of human history were full of blood, violence, and crime. The God in the Bible has been protecting the criminals. Therefore whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Because Cain is a criminal, we can fully understand it as, Therefore whosoever slayeth the criminal, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. We can conclude we had better become criminals, because the criminals are protected, and the good men are not. The good men have the risk of being revenged sevenfold. The Prophet and the Dream In the Bible, there are a large number of prophets and dreams. The prophets are the representatives of the God in the mortal world. They have unimaginable wisdom and power, which sink the average people with average wisdom into the mist. If someone says, I am a prophet, should we believe him or not? If we don't, we are standing against the God. If we do, how can we know the prophet is a fake or not? Now let's talk about the dreams. There are many dreams and dream analysis in the Bible, in particular in the Revelation. Of course, those who can analyze the dreams are all prophets, but they have also brought a lot of puzzles. First, has the prophet had the dream at all? No one could see his dream, and he could well compose some dreams and cheat us. If he really had the dream, was his analysis correct? Or was he analyzing the dream on the reverse aspect? I want to ask the God in the Bible, in the Old Testament, you used to talk directly with the human beings. Then why you stop doing so later? Are the Adam and Eve on other planets also disobeying your orders? Why would you warn the human beings in the form of dreams? Why not tell us the truth directly? Don't you have the ability to do so? Don't you have time? Don't you have some secret sorrow? I can give many other examples to state that the God in the Bible does not have the features of being unique and exclusive, amorphous, neutral, mysterious, impartial, supremely powerful, merciful and wise as genuine greatest creator has. So we can affirm that the God in the Bible is not the genuine greatest creator.